Hi, everybody. Welcome to the October uh, Law Health Coordinator Call. Give me uh, one moment. I'm, I'm uh, just in the process of unmuting everyone because I'm hoping that this call will be very discussion oriented. So rather than keeping everyone muted, I'm going to make sure that everybody um, can speak up freely and easily as necessary. If we have problems with feedback uh, or background noise, I may mute everyone again and, um, and uh, you know, have people participate through the questions feature. But uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to have an open conversation. Uh, if people have concerns about background noise as we go, please just let me know. Um, OK, and I just wanted to look really quickly and see. Um, hey, Raphael, is, is Nikki back in the office yet? No, not yet. Oh, no, I'm sorry. She okay. is, actually. I see her. She is. Excellent. All right, I'll just give her. I'll give her a moment to sign in. Um, Nikki Demel, for those of you that that don't know, is part of the Pro Bono Net uh, team. She works on the um, Pro Bono Net platform for New York, uh, and she is uh, very involved in coordinating with the ABA Free Legal Answers Program in New York. Um, so. I want to make sure that she's able to participate in the first half of our discussion today. I'm just going to give her a moment to get situated at her at her computer. All right. While we're doing that, I, I think I'll just um, go through the the fire speech. Hopefully, everyone can see my screen. Um, Welcome. If this is your first time using GoToWebinar, um, it's uh, important to be aware of a few features of the panel that you should see on your monitor. Um, you can mute or unmute yourself using the green uh, microphone button. And so if you find that you're contributing to the background noise, you may want to mute yourself locally and then unmute yourself when you want to talk. Um, if you're having trouble connecting via your computer, you can also dial in over the telephone. That's what I tend to do. Um, because I find it's a little bit more reliable. Uh, and you can switch to the telephone here, and then you'll find a telephone number and an access code. Um, typically, if you wanted to ask a question on a webinar like this, you would use this questions feature down here. But as I said, for this webinar in particular, uh, I've just opened up the conversation to everyone um, so that hopefully we can have a, a free conversation about, about these issues. OK, um, so the first thing that I wanted to talk with everyone about today is the, um, one moment, come on, there we go. The first thing that I wanted to speak with everybody about today is the ABA Free Legal Answers Program. Um, this is a program that was originally developed in Tennessee. Uh, that the ABA has, has sort of taken on as a national initiative and is working on rolling out to all sorts of different states. You'll find it at freelegalanswers.org. That site looks like this, and then you can select sort of state-specific versions. Um, in a nutshell, this is how the ABA describes the program on these sites. Um, so visitors can answer a few questions to see if they qualify to use the service, at which point they can um, write up a question and leave it in the system for an attorney volunteer to pick up and answer. This is actual legal advice, not mere legal information. It's a brief interaction, so it doesn't create an ongoing relationship. Uh, when the attorney has answered the question, the uh, visitor will receive an email letting them know that they can log into the system to read the response. Um, we're not going to get too deeply into the details of how this system works, um, or at least we may in the conversation, but in my brief introduction, I won't. There are a couple of features that I um, want to point out to folks, just because when I was reading through it, it seemed important to know. Um, it can be difficult to get details, because in order to um, sort of see the system, you have to register for it and certify various things. Uh, 
but reading the terms of service for attorneys, um, there were a couple of things that stood out to me. First, um, all those individual states, it sounds as though um, they may require a conflicts check. In, in general, the program um, does not do a, a conflicts check and asks visitors to uh, waive their right to, um, to that expectation. Uh, and then, second of all, I thought it was sort of an interesting feature that uh, when lawyers sign up for the service, uh, the fact that this model exists and that these websites are rolling out in various states um, does not mean that the website is expressing an opinion on whether um, this model of service is ethical in a given uh, jurisdiction. Um, whether or not it's ethical is, is left up to the judgment of the individual lawyers who choose to volunteer um, via this method. Uh, so I don't think that's necessarily uh, germane to what I'd like to talk with you all about today, but I just felt as though it, it was important um, to, to point out. Uh, the, the details of these programs will vary from, from state to state. Uh, but the reason why I think it's it's uh, helpful, it might be helpful to have a conversation broadly about um, what this program means and, and how we can think about it, is because it complicates um, the vision for statewide legal information websites that the LSC has set out. Um, you know, if if law help uh, sites and statewide legal websites in general um, can't uh, find a, a way to uh, harmonize the services that they offer with this new initiative from the ABA, um, it's going to potentially fragment the, the way in which legal services are presented to visitors um, you know, looking for help online, which is the, the opposite of the goals that the LSC set out with, with the entire um, statewide legal information uh, initiative that they defined in 2013. And so I'd like to just have an open conversation with the people on the call about you know, what, how people think the relationship between law help and in the states that have live help and this new ABA Free Legal Answers program can, um, can best be understood and uh, explained to our visitors and uh, how we can best uh, acknowledge this Free Legal Answers program and hopefully integrate it um, into the way we're trying to help visitors on, on law help sites. Um, and in particular, uh, the, the nature of the relationship between these two programs, I think, is going to depend a lot on the underlying relationships between the different organizations in individual states where these two programs exist. And so it may come up that, that the ABA Free Legal Answers program rolls out in a state and there isn't a very close working relationship between that program and the, the law help program. And in those situations, are there things that, that can be done on law help um, unilaterally to uh, integrate these, these programs or explain them in, in context with one another such that we, we uh, are able to maintain the ABA's vision for a sort of unified presence for legal services on, online. Um, that's the general uh, setup for the conversation that I'm hoping to have with you all today. Uh, I'll do my best to provide context and, and background to the extent that I can, but really I'm hoping to take a back seat and, and uh, facilitate while, um, while you, know, you folks who are actually in the driver's seat in various jurisdictions that may be seeing this program come in um, can uh, uh, can have the actual conversation. Can everyone hear me? Yes, can anyone hear me? Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Cool. 
Um, I don't know, uh, Emily, if you can talk at all about your experience in um, uh, Minnesota, and you know, Minnesota is not using the uh, free legal answers program, but they have a similar program, as I understand it, um, that uh, Law Help MN has has um, you know already sort of tightly integrated with their their service um, on the the um, legal information portal. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and a couple things that might be useful for people to know is that um, our Minnesota Legal Advice Online was built on the original Tennessee platform, so it like looks and functions similarly, but at this point it's an older, a slightly older um, platform that we're actually in the process of redesigning. Um, and then our office um, in Minnesota we run that website. We are also the administrators locally for our law help website and for ProJustice. So we're in a really nice position, actually, of having control over all three of those. Um, and the way that it has integrated here, um, th there's a lot of back and forth. But um, as you can see on our law help, um, as you saw on our law help website, we have a link to the legal advice online um, along with other clinics because really we see legal advice online as essentially um, a walk-in legal clinic that's available 24 hours a day regardless of your geographic location. Um, and while we're not a massive state by Western standards, we are a fairly big state um, and so there's a lot of people in Minnesota who are not close to walk-in legal clinics or other resources, and so this is another way um, for them to get assistance. And then um, we do have, we kind of use law help also. We encourage our attorneys who are responding to questions on the online legal advice site um, to link to a lot of the fact sheets and resources and to use those either to help enhance their knowledge of the issue or also um, sometimes what we see is that the questions that are coming in on online legal advice um, are often answered by some of the resources available on law help. And so we try to make sure that the people using the legal advice online, the attorneys, are aware of those resources. Um, and also if they need to make referrals, if they um, are giving advice to somebody and want to make a referral um, either to legal aid or to find you know, if there is somebody needs help filling out paperwork, um, we tell them, you know, that Law Help is a great resource for finding those referrals. So that's kind of how we've tried to go back and forth between the two um, resources. And when people um, come to the um, Legal Advice Online program, can you tell when they're coming from Law Help MN? Yeah, we can see it. Our Google Analytics um, tells us, and Law Help is one of our highest, um, I think possibly the highest source of traffic. Um, and I can add that from the Live Help standpoint, um, it is sometimes a resource that um, our live chat operators will, you know, if we're interacting with somebody and it's clear that they need something more than, um, again, direction to finding a resource. They're really looking to have a question answered with legal advice. Um, that is one of the referrals also on live chat that we will direct people to, um, especially because somebody who's using live chat, our theory is, um, already is somewhat web savvy. Um, that's where they're looking for help. And so the online legal advice may be a good fit for those people. Mm -hmm. um, and do the questions that come in, uh, are they typically clear enough and well-formed enough for attorneys to be able to provide a meaningful answer, or is there usually some back and forth required? You know, it's, um, it's a little bit hit or miss, to be honest. Um, my experience is that 
you know, probably 60% of the questions, 65% of the questions that come in through Legal Advice Online are reasonably well formed, have some background information, and can be at least um, preliminarily answered without much back and forth. Um, there's, you know, another 35% that are either um, so vague <laughs> that it's really hard to answer, like, tell me about spousal maintenance. Um, or they are so detailed um, and so specific that it's challenging because probably the person is there because they've sort of exhausted all other reasonable resources. And that chunk of questions also is really difficult in that brief advice format. Gotcha. And um, do, you, do you use Law Help MN at all to sort of set uh, to help people prepare to craft a meaningful question, or or have you um, have you experimented with that with that approach at all? Do you think that that would be useful? So we would like to. Um, right now, the way that our site is built, we don't have a good way to do that. Um, mm -hmm. What I do occasionally as an as an administrator is if somebody has posted one of those super broad questions like, "How do I go about getting a divorce?" Um, I'll respond to them sort of right after they post the question and say, here's a link to our divorce booklet um, with the link to Law Help and say maybe, you know, I would recommend that you go read this and then if you still have questions or you have more specific questions, come back here and post those more specific questions. Um, part of our redesign of the site is we would like to make better prompts and make it integrate better so that when somebody selects on the drop-down topics, for their online question, that um, it would sort of first pop up a link automatically to Law Help and some of those resources. So if they select divorce, it would say, you know, have, here's some other resources you can look at in the meantime, so that they can still post their question, but they're also maybe getting linked out to those things faster. Right. So based on the topic that they choose in MLAO, they're they're referred to, to background reading that they can do on their own while they're waiting for an answer. Exactly. And right yeah, right now we don't have that integrated, but that's one of our major goals for our redesign and why we're pursuing it. That's very clever. Yeah. Um, so from the uh, from people on the rest of the call, does anyone have sort of reactions to the conversation? Questions? Are, is there sort of uh, are there any crucial pieces of information or additional details that I um, that that you really need in order to to begin to form your own opinions that we haven't provided yet? Um, are you just uh, questioning why we're taking the time to have this conversation as a group? Uh, Am I unmuted? Everyone is unmuted, yes. Okay. Um, well, my name is Sandra, and I'm with Vermont Legal Aid, and our state is um, going to be rolling this out. And I, I um, attended this today because you were discussing this, because I had the same questions when I was first told, um, we need to put something on our website that sends people to this, and I'm like, Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> okay, so I have some concerns about that fragmenting and um, the fact that, um, you know, there, there's a, a, a good way to, we definitely send people to a lot of resources within the context of our site, but what worries me is them coming off and then coming onto the site and then saying, oh, I can go here and get a free um, question answered, and then they kind of go off <laughs> to do that. And my understanding is I've been told that it can take up to 25 days for them to be told whether or not they will get an answer to their question. And if so, um, you know, is that clear? And, and so hopefully these aren't going to be any pressing legal questions, and is that you know, made clear in the, the information they're presented once they get there. Right. So that's interesting. You're you're worried that this option is 
in, in essence, too attractive, and that when people know that it's available, they may think, well, all I have to do is write one email, and then I can stop um, thinking about this problem. Um, I don't know that I would exactly characterize it that way, but um, it's sort of, um, I, I guess it was a concern that, uh, I mean, it depends on whether you're the type who likes to spend a lot of time browsing and trying to find <laughs> an answer, or whether you'd rather just ask somebody right off the bat. So, I don't know. Yeah, no, that's... Or it has to do with there are other things that we're sending people to do. Um, you know, here's our online triage. Let us help you get... Oh, no, you can go here and you can ask this question. Or you can... So I just feel like we're kind of fragmented, as you would say. Mm. Um, Nikki, do you have a sense, uh, based on, on the New York program, of how long it can take to get an answer? Is that something that's come across? Um, I think actually how long you take to answer the questions or the timeline that you set to answer the questions is completely dependent on how the state's choosing to roll it out. And I know that New York's kind of only in the pilot phase at the moment and their admin is monitoring responses to questions and they've only received 10 questions to date. Um, and I think they're, they're, they're having a very quick turnaround within a week kind of thing at the moment. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, I think it just depends on um, various different different factors including you know what types of questions you're getting in and what kind of volunteers are there to be, that are able to answer the questions and things like that. Right. Has the program, has the New York program been widely publicized to date or is it still pretty unknown? It, just because it's doing like a, a soft launch to see how it rolls out in the beginning, there hasn't been any publicity around the site and how to access either from the point of view of an individual that wants to ask a legal question or from the volunteer point of view of trying to participate in the program. So they've tried to contain the pilot in the soft launch just to see how various various pieces are coming together. And then I think they're going to they have a much broader outreach um, strategy planned for next year. Um, so, in, in Vermont, Sandra, are you working very closely with, with the ABA on their, um, on the free legal answer stuff, or, or are your organizations um, less tightly uh, associated? No, that's the good thing. Our, um, our um, I work for Vermont Legal Aid um, and the LSC organization in Vermont is uh, Lawline and they oversee our pro bono, um, the statewide pro bono network and they also have taken this on mainly so that we could, <laughs> you know, have the, you know, in the thick of it as opposed to, um, so yeah. They, they definitely have gotcha. some control. I was just surprised at the whole thing. You know, they. My understanding of it is, um, I mean, my main part is how is it? How are we going to let people know about this on the website? That's really my main role here. But right. my understanding from the person who's in charge of it, fortunately, our um, law line people are going to be looking at and taking as many of the questions as they can. But some of them won't be things that we deal with, so we'll need to, you know, farm those out. And and the idea that it could take uh, a good amount of time for people to get an answer, right. uh, I don't know. That was just one of the concerns that I had. But I'm sure they have that all worked out in a way that they feel comfortable with. Yeah. Well, it sounds as though um, you know the the idea that Emily was describing, which Minnesota hasn't implemented yet might work really well in that situation, right? Where, it, especially if it's going to take a while for the question to be, you know, evaluated and, and, um, and answered, uh, to say to people after they've submitted it, you know, it may take a while for us to get to your question. While you're waiting, since you chose divorce as the topic, you may want to review these materials that you can find on the information portal. Um, 
I, I, you know, so that even if they come and land on on your site and then sort of uh, almost too quickly uh, move over to asking their question on the on the legal answers program at the end of the process of submitting that question, there's sort of a gentle nudge to direct them back to the information. Mm -hmm. Um, so that that seems like a really helpful model, um, especially in in situations where you're able to have that kind of uh, exchange, uh, where where the organizations running both sides are are invested in in making the linkages between the two parts of the system very strong. I know that um, in New York that's been more of a challenge. Uh, the relationship is a little bit more. Uh, I don't know if dysfunctional is too strong a word. Uh, Nikki, you would you would know better than me. But it, it may be that we sort of end up with with one model where where the in, in places where these things are working very very tightly together. Um, but I'm wondering if if anybody has experience um, or is in a situation where they're afraid that it will be harder to coordinate um, and has thoughts about how. Uh, Legal information portals might be able to uh, hold down their their stated ambition to be, um, you know, a unified clearinghouse for these sorts of services, um, even as uh, new programs are springing up that that are not necessarily going to acknowledge them as such. Um, <clears throat> I will, uh, you know, from a from a technical standpoint, I, you know, I, I think that e um, even if there isn't a a link on the other end, you know, when people complete the uh, free legal answers question that suggests that they go back to to the statewide information portal, even if that's not achievable in a particular state. Um, one way to try to get around that, uh, assuming this 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 was if, would be acceptable, would be to embed the um, free legal answers platform inside a law help frame. So, for example, um, if this were to go to a free legal answers site instead of um, just this page, we you know you could theoretically load the MLAO portal inside the law help frame such that, for example, this bit at the top um, would still be present. I don't know if that would risk um, confusing visitors and, and making them think that, that they were still on law help, if there would be a way to indicate that they, that they weren't, but that would make it easy for them to get back to the other features of the portal as soon as they had finished using this, this other site. You know, it's possible to embed one site inside another the way that you do with, with YouTube. Again, I'm just talking about what's technically feasible. I don't have an opinion about the, the most advisable way to, to approach this problem. Um, I also think that uh, in the way that, that Minnesota is doing here, it's possible to provide you know, more rather than less context for people before they move from the legal information portal onto um, the, the legal advice you know online email clinic or however you want to describe it. Uh, and in, in particular, you know, legal information portals could seek to help people figure out how to prepare a really solid question that has the right level of, of detail and context for an attorney to quickly and easily um, you know, provide a meaningful answer. Uh, that's, that's a role that I think legal information could fill really well and very synergistically 
with, with what this new program is trying to achieve. Um, those, those are just my opinions, though. Um, Hi, Sam. Yes. Hey, it's the New Orleans. I just someone may have covered this in the general discussion, but I just want to make sure I didn't miss it. Did anyone create like a special disclaimer for free legal answers that might like frame the link if you choose to link to this from a law help site? Because it really is different, and like everything we stress mm -hmm. in law help and law help for our state is that this is not legal advice. This is legal information. So that's the mm -hmm. essence of tension for us. Difficult because I'm really right. going to confuse people. So but right. So it's, it's interesting. Have, like, they probably have their own disclaimer, but I mean, does a law help site have a special disclaimer before sending people over there? I may have missed it, but I just want to make sure. Uh, I, there is no no. There is no general disclaimer that anybody has crafted. I think that. You know, trying to come up with something like that would be a really interesting action item to take away from this this meeting. But this this is the first attempt to, to try to 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 think about whether there are are requirements like that, and um, you know, things that we can do in a in a unified way. Um, the details of of individual um, uh, terms may vary from state to state. You know, uh, it's you know, so so whatever we come up with, you might have to sort of uh, tweak it slightly for your particular jurisdiction. But I think that that's a really good project potentially that um, some some group of us might want to take on. Uh, how was that something that you thought about in in Minnesota, Emily? And was that part of how you approached this um, piece at the bottom, where you're sort of trying to help move people from the legal information portal over into the world of legal advice? Um, you know, I don't know if that was exactly our thought, but I think we know that a lot of people are coming into Law Help, and like from our live chat, a lot of the questions that we're getting are people looking for advice, really, as opposed to information. Um, and I think we just wanted to make clear what it is, which is why we added the what is legal advice at the bottom of our page because we, you know, we know what this difference is between legal information and legal advice, but um, that's not always super clear to other people. Um, and so I think it was, you know, really our idea, I believe, was to make that clear and to also facilitate, you know, for people who are really looking to get an answer in the form of advice, you know, how do you get that? Mm -hmm. Are you, um, so if we fail to sort of make that line um, well delineated, Lisa, uh, how would you describe your concerns? Well, my concern, my main concern is that, you know, the legal information sites are about legal information, not legal advice. And we stress that, you know, legal advice can only be given by an attorney licensed in your state who's that's giving information specific to your from situation who has an attorney-client relationship with you. That generally is in our, you know, disclaimer. So a lot of these free legal answer sites, they kind of like try to straddle that. Like they're kind of shy away maybe from like there's an attorney-client relationship. Um, and you might be anonymous and people are waving. And then there's that, the thing that I think is most troublesome is this idea that each attorney has to decide if it's ethical for him or herself, and I think that's, I mean, either the service, like maybe the Attorney General will issue an opinion saying either the service is ethical in your state or not, but putting the burden on the individual attorney volunteers to decide whether the whole idea is ethical or not, I think is problematic. Mm. Unless it's the yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't, right, I don't disagree. That's why that was a particular feature of this, um, this document that I that I felt I wanted to call people's attention to. The version that I was reading is that I was quoting from is the New York version, which I will I can put in the chat window. This is a link to the 
the New York Agreement for Attorneys. Um, so I, yeah, I I I absolutely hear hear what you're saying. Um, I'm not saying that means it's not proper, but maybe it's that it's okay in New York, and they're asking attorneys in a given situation to determine whether answering the question is ethical. But you know, I'm, I'm not. I just you know, not sure about that. I know Louisiana is trying to kick this off, uh, Louisiana, and I, I think it might be something that best resides maybe on a site other than Law Help because I think it does get confusing for folks out there. And I think there are other ways of promoting this, you know, like through your state bar or access to justice committee or something. But I think, I think building it with a Law Help site is potentially problematic. Not necessarily, but potentially, unless it's really clear that this is something else, you know, and it's a party service and Right. So, I'll just know, ask from Minnesota briefly please. to clarify on the sort of ethical piece. I think part of it is, I mean, our state rules also explicitly have a limited scope representation provision. And when we were launching in Minnesota, we got an opinion from the ethics board that basically says what you're doing <laughs> essentially is limited scope representation. Um, and then I think the individual lawyer decision, I think some people don't like limited scope. Um, that's cool, um, and they don't have to do it, you know. And so I think potentially that's what it's getting at. But I think that probably they wrote the language to be um, to kind of cover the fact that I don't, without knowing, I have no idea if every state has um, incorporated the limited scope language into their own ethical rules. Right. Um, we have right. in Minnesota and our basically is. That. Well, I it's see you have that. Yeah. And here's the, this is the limited scope language in, in the New York terms, just for mm -hmm. reference. I think the user has to understand what it is. Yeah. Because see, he's all over law help. We want to make sure no one thinks he or she has an attorney-client relationship with the website. It's not legal advice, you know, on and on and on. So I think the most critical thing is what the end user's perception is. And Right. You know, good scope representation is representation, and we don't want anyone thinking that law helps representing them, you know, because, or we don't want anyone thinking that a live help volunteer who's a law student who's not even licensed is representing them. I mean, we have that all over the place. So while this is right. an interesting addition to the uh, menu of resources, I think it's one that has to be um, handled with care. Absolutely. Nikki, do you, do you know for New York, um, what what the agreement is that the that the clients have to, to sign because um, they don't show it to you until after you fill out a application um, and I'm not actually in New York so I'm not eligible um, and so I haven't I haven't taken that step. So in New York, I know for the volunteer side, when you you can't actually sign up to be a volunteer until you finish a limited scope ethics training. Um, so they they are really focused on making sure that the attorney is themselves are directly aware of the importance of what kind of relationship they're building with the client. I had the same issue as you with the um, with what the client or the user actually sees when they log on to the site. And in New York, it's um, it's actually getting rolled out by the New York State Bar Association. It's one of their initiatives, and it's not currently referenced on Law Help New York, they're expecting most of their traffic to come through from Google or kind of other internal resources through their hotline or things like that. So that issue of the but disclaimer you, and how to carve mm -hmm. it out for Law Help hasn't actually come out come up as a something that we've actually crafted yeah. yet. But have you seen the agreement that, that the new clients have to sign? No, I have the same I have the same issue as you, Sam. Like yeah. with that same okay. page. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very it's very tricky. Um, so I guess uh, Lisa, part of the sort of urgency of this is that even if there are, um, you know, e even if there are things about the program that that you have that that um, you know give you pause or, or about which you have misgivings, um, it's you know it's rolling out in Louisiana, and um, one of the things that I'm that I'm hoping to address here is is the sort of um, even if it's not ideal, um, you know, in, in individual people's judgment, it is something that's, that's coming. And if we if we fail to find a way to acknowledge it, then um, the statewide information portal risks no longer serving its goal of, of providing a comprehensive picture of the options available in your state. 
Yeah, I have a feeling that we might be able to like meld this into one of like if we do this in connection with our like we have a burgeoning network of self help centers that are courthouse based mm -hmm. or other based. And we might be able to put this on a resource page that's like a state bar resource, you know, something that couches it, that just doesn't send people there from the home page, you know, so they realize it's not hosted by law help. Like if we make clear, you know, because we even have lawyer referral yeah. information, which is not free, you know, like and how to get a private attorney. Like if we have some sort of information resource on the site that just tells people about it but does not constitute an endorsement or does, mm. isn't trained as part of law health. If it's clear it's an outside resource, just the way any legal aid office might be, you know, but different. That might right. be the way to handle as just another online resource. That's yeah, listed. and that's the opposite of the, the technical suggestion that I was making. That makes a lot of sense. That's, that's an interesting perspective. Thank you. Yeah, I hope if, if other people come up with things that they want to share, like in terms of ways of it, describing it or anything, I'd, that would be so helpful if they have anything they'd like to share, you know, after they've gone live. Because I know what's happening here is just a question of how to handle it. So. Right. The, um, the other thing that came up in New York, and I'd be interested to hear if it came up in any of the other states, was this idea of the volunteers that are using the site, they, might, they may not necessarily be aware of the law help network and that their self-help information and referrals and this kind of whole ecosystem of information out there that they can refer um, their clients through through, you know, in how they respond to the, to the question that's posed and whether it would make sense to kind of create like a webinar training or some kind of way to kind of help people know about this and the do-it-yourself forms and that kind of self-help network. Um, I'd just be interested to hear whether any other states have had that conversation or are thinking about that. That's a good question. Emily, you know, you described the, the site working in that, in that way in Minnesota, which made me very happy um, because when I think about, you know, sort of key use cases for law help, one of them is attorneys that are working with clients, you know, being able to sort of quickly and easily um, direct them to further reading on a particular topic to help them understand the advice that they give. Um, uh, is that something that's come about organically or have you fostered it through the kind of trainings that Nikki is describing? No, I'd say we've definitely made an effort to foster it. We have three, I would say there's kind of three different pools through which we do that. Um, one of them is we do have um, a kind of an information page that I'm not sure how many of the attorneys use, but it's housed on Pro Justice MN that has just some Q&A about how to use the site and included there is how to make referrals and links to some of the law health information. Um, the other thing that we do and that um, I know Tennessee was doing and I would assume they'll continue is we send out a weekly email to all of the um, legal advice online volunteers kind of saying here's the questions that are available um, and then that's an opportunity where often like if when we launched a new um, interview on the law help site to help people with motion to modify um, spousal maintenance we I linked to that and included information about it in that weekly email so that kind of the attorneys there know um, and I just make it a point um, probably once or twice a month at least to say oh yeah if you're answering a question about this just a reminder here's law help and here's a link um, to some helpful resources that you might include for people, um, so it's kind of just a continual drumbeat there. And then when we have done trainings, um, we always incorporate those resources because a lot of the pro bono attorneys um, aren't necessarily full-time practitioners in the area, and so it's helpful for them to know where to go for those resources. And I can tell you that I see in the answers that our volunteers are providing um, that they are linking to those tools. Gotcha. That's very helpful. Yeah, and so the right the, the weekly email to volunteers is something that you have control over because of the sort of integrated nature of your relationship with the legal advice clinic. Um, but the info page on your Pro Bono Net site. With Pro Bono Justice MN is your uh, Pro Justice MN is your Pro Bono .net site. Is that correct? 
Yep, I can actually, let me yep. just pull the link, because that information, it's in front of the password wall um, very okay. intentionally. So I'll just send that link out if anybody wants to look at what um, is available there. Yeah, and I will throw that up. Um, I'll throw it on the screen for a moment as well. Um, sure. Because this is a strategy that that would play well um, even in states where there isn't a tightly integrated relationship between the two programs. Um, so this this one I think works in both the 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 easy case and the hard case, um, which is very useful. Oh, this is great. I play language matters. I like that very much. Thank you. I'm have to. <laughs> I will be looking at this carefully. Um, yeah. In, in, in the immediate future. Uh, great. So, you know, to, um, to sum up, uh, you know, there's sort of a role on law help, a potential role on law help um, to provide people context about, you know, what they can expect from brief services, how long they might need to wait for an answer, um, the difference between advice that they might receive through this mechanism versus uh, the pure information that law help itself provides or the legal information platforms um, provide. Uh, there's also a potential role, if possible, on the Legal Answers Program to uh, refer people back to legal information, you know, to help them, um, you know, in the, in the period while they're waiting for an answer so that they can better interpret the answer or potentially even find some of what they need on their own um, while they're waiting for an attorney to address their their question. Uh, it may be worth, and if people are interested in this, um, please let me know because I'd be happy to facilitate. It may be worth seeing if we can get a group of people together who are in states that are that are um, you know facing this program imminent introduction to try to come up with the kind of disclaimer that Lisa was mentioning, if there's a general way to write it, um, so that folks that are on the legal information platforms can sort of understand what they're getting themselves into and, and how how this is a departure from from the model that that they'll find, you know, when they're when they're on the legal information platform um, itself. Uh, and then also there there are various things that we can do not only to sort of provide um, context and preparation for clients, but also to provide context and preparation for attorneys so that they realize that they can that they can use legal information as a way to supplement their advice um, and and uh, you know provide uh, deeper deeper background to to their clients uh, quickly and and easily. Um, let me just chat out. This is this is not the URL for the, the newsletter, um, Sandra, but I've just put into the, the full chat. This is the URL that Emily shared for the um, the uh, legal advice online clinic. I don't know, Emily, if it would be it probably wouldn't be appropriate because you mentioned that the newsletters include the questions that are available. Um, um, so I just probably didn't the, yeah, the newsletter that we do, actually, we just include the number of questions in each category. We don't include oh. um, any identifying information. Yeah. Um, it's just an if it email. Would, Let me... yeah. If it would be appropriate, it might be very helpful to forward an example to the Law Help List search. Um, and then sure. folks would, would be able to see what that looks like. Yeah. Thank you. That's that's great. Um, okay, so I think that's sort of what we were able to come up with in our in our discussion today. Thank you, thank you guys so much. Um, that that uh, went on a little bit longer than I planned, but it started to get you know it started to pick up toward the end, and I didn't want to cut it short. Um, I think that this is definitely something that we may need to talk about more in the future. But I'm pleased to have been able to lay some of the groundwork um, with you today. Uh, and if you have you know, follow-up questions or comments, I think that, that the Law Help Reserve would be a great place to, to which to address them. Uh, yeah, I look forward to helping 
everybody, as we all sort of work to figure out the best way to, to handle this new program. Uh, okay, as a, as a next phase, um, we're going to discuss something that is very specific to the Law Help platform. So thank you so much for coming. Um, it's always a pleasure to, um, to see people that are not on the Law Help platform. And um, I'm, I'm always particularly pleased when I find a way to make these these calls relevant to you know a, a broader audience. Um, that's that's part of what we try to do here. But uh, this next part uh, will definitely affect you less. And so for for you and others on the call um, who came for the ABA portion, uh, this would be a fine time to drop out. The second topic of conversation. We only have a few minutes left, but hopefully this will be enough time for me to quickly um, take folks' temperature and and get a feeling on how we should approach this problem is uh, I'd like to talk with everybody about the organization update feedback feature. Uh, you may recall, uh, well, I should, I should check for questions before I, before I move on. Are there any, uh, how come I don't see questions? I'm sorry, everyone. One moment, please. OK. Um, I, don't, I don't think that there are any questions, so I think, although I, Uh, okay, so the organization update feedback feature in, in the interest of trying to squeeze this into the very tail end of this call. Um, those of you that were on the June call or, or that watched the recording or looked at the PowerPoint may, may remember that this feature was one of the components of the new organization update system that we developed uh, last spring as part of uh, TIG funded work that we did with uh, Law Help New York. Um, one of the features of that system is that there's now this area at the bottom of every organization profile inviting visitors to report problems with that profile. So if you if you expand this area, you see a form like this. And when you fill it out, um, it's recorded as feedback specific to the organization profile and stored in the organization manager so that you can sort your organization manager based on how much feedback a particular organization has received. Um, and then when you look at that organization's profile, you'll see the feedback in the sidebar and you can use it to take action. And the idea here was that people would use this to report problems or provide corrections for the profile. So if they tried calling the number, for example, and they got a message saying that it was disconnected, they could report that um, to you. And then if you are trying to figure out which organizations you should focus on when you're looking to maintain your, your referral directory, you can sort your list to see which profile have received the greatest number of, of complaints or notices that something about the profile is not working correctly. And then you can prioritize those, go in, see what the complaints are, and, and you know reach out to that organization to get their new phone number or find out if they've since closed down, that sort of thing. This was how it was intended to function. Importantly, this is different than the site-wide feedback feature that some sites choose to take advantage of, where you know there's a single feedback page for the entire site where people can leave messages that then show up in the feedback manager, which is a separate tool that lives in this feedback area of the um, admin inbox. Some sites use this to accept requests for, for help, and this is, this is a way that is set up to do that, but what we've seen over the last couple of months as people have um, uh, begun engaging with the new organization update tool is that in some situations people are using this area uh, not to report problems with the profile but to um, uh, ask for legal help. And uh, this is not how the tool is intended to work and it's very challenging because these messages do not go into any um, unified place. The only way to get to get to them is to look at the individual profile on which they were left because they're meant to be specific to that profile. And so this is a challenge because if this is the, the, the primary way in which people are using um, this form in your state, you will be left with a uh, whole bunch of legal help requests that are spread throughout the entire back end, you know, on various uh, individual profile pages. And the only way to see those 
would be to click into the individual profile page and um, and read them here. And so uh, this hasn't been everyone's experience with the tool, but I've heard this from a handful of folks, and it's uh, enough of a cause for concern that I wanted to bring it to the attention of the community and have a conversation about whether this is a feature that we need to remove or revise. Um, and, and just so you know, if we decide that, that this particular aspect of the update tool needs to be revised in the near term, um, that means that it will likely be removed um, until we have time to figure out what revisions might be helpful and to actually implement them. The good news is that this is an easy feature for us to excise on a site-by-site -site basis. And I think that in two cases, um, at the request of um, folks like you, I have already taken this feature off of individual sites. Um, so you can just write me a quick email if you're, if you're very concerned about this, and this area will disappear from your site in a matter of minutes. Um, but I'm curious, uh, in just a, a, a few moments, if this is a problem that, that uh, people have noticed broadly, or that, that um, seems particularly concerning to you, uh, if you have if you have thoughts about the best way to proceed here, or conversely, whether this is a feature that you find very useful and that and that um, you know you're glad we have. Yeah, this is Laura in Oregon. Hi. Hey there. Uh, as you know, we are one of the states where you turned off the feature because we were encountering requests for legal assistance. Uh, I've just had a thought, though. What if you changed it from a fillable form w requiring email and a description of the of the problem to a simple radio button, perhaps multiple choice, you know, phone number yeah. inactive or no such address or something? so that people were not actually able to give personal information and ask a question. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a potential solution here. Um, it'll make it, I think the, the reason why we didn't go that direction at, at first is because it'll make it a little bit harder to interpret exactly what the, um, the issue with the profile might be, but I think that that, that seems preferable to pulling it entirely um, and would, would prevent this, this problem. Yeah, I think that, that that could work. It'll be a question of figuring out the best time for us um, to build in that change. And in the interim, I think that the solution, you know, for folks in your situation is is to remove the feature. Um, but that's a that's a very good thought, and I can certainly write that up and um, look for space to insert that into the roadmap. Great. Okay, um, so we only have two minutes left. Uh, we don't necessarily have to have a broad discussion on this. You may want to take the time um, to go into your organization manager and look at this feedback tab, see if you have any profiles on which people have left feedback, and then look at those profiles to see what the character of the feedback you're receiving is. Um, and if you are receiving feedback in a way that seems problematic to you, Again, you can write me a quick email, and I will be able to take down that feature for you in a matter of minutes. Um, so at the very least, uh, this call can you know, bring, bring your attention to, uh, to a potential issue, and uh, you'll be able to decide on your own how you'd like to handle it in the near term. All right, so that's, that's it for now. Um, the last thing that I want to say is that uh, we are in the process of working on various projects that I mentioned in August um, that we're going to be delivering as part of our pig-funded work uh, in the last quarter of 2016. Uh, there's going to be a call either at the end of October or at the very beginning of November where you'll have a chance um, to see some of the work that's happening there in, in slightly greater detail. Um, that's that's a goal that that I'm aiming for, um, and the reason why there's going to be a separate call for that is just that the timing of the coordinator call um, didn't mesh well with the development timeline for that work. Um, so you may be hearing more about that in the relatively near future. 
Uh, that's it for me. Any general comments, questions before we adjourn? Okay, sounds great. Um, thanks for attending, everybody. I hope this was a um, useful way to spend your morning or afternoon. And uh, I'll talk to you all later, hopefully. Bye. Thanks, Sam. You're very Thanks, welcome. Sam.